Okay, we're now live. Okay, that's great. And first of all, apologies to all of you for the slight delay. This happens sometimes with the technology, but uh, well done to the FM team for actually getting us back up and running. So thank you to them. So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the decision days of myself and the executive lead member for economy, transport and environment, as well as the executive member for highways operations. These decision days are being broadcast in one session live on YouTube via the County Council website. I'd also like to welcome Councillor Stephen Philpott, who is the Select Committee Chairman, Councillor Martin Todd, the Opposition Spokesperson, and I think Louise Parker-Jones hasn't joined us, but she, she might throughout, throughout the meeting. ...today, uh, plus a local County Councillor, which I would take at the start of the relevant items. So I know, Katie, for so those uh, members that are present, and those deputies, we will let, we will give you a bit of warning that when you will be speaking on those agenda items. So I'm going to go straight into agenda item one, which is the Winchester Movement Strategy, and ask David Jowsey to uh, present the report, please. David, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, the Winchester Movement Strategy was adopted in spring 2019 by Hampshire County Council and Winchester City Council following extensive consultation. And since that adoption, we've been using the strategy to support a number of successful funding bids and also undertaken a series of studies, studies uh, looking forward to put, looking to put forward various recommendations on how to achieve the vision of the movement strategy. Over recent months, county and city council officers have been developing an action plan of key transport improvements that need to be developed and delivered to achieve the movement strategy. We would now like to undertake public and stakeholder engagement on the next steps of the strategy, including 10 prioritised schemes. And this engagement will help to prioritise investment, uh, use the results of the engagement to support future funding bids uh, and identify any kind of key challenges of our proposals. So the recommendations within the decision day report are to firstly approve the draft action plan, including the 10 priority schemes, give approval to undertake public engagement, and then also give approval to delegate authority to the director of ETE for further consultation as required on any schemes listed in the action plan. David, OK, many thanks for that. Much appreciated. Um, Councillor Todd, do you want to make some comments on this paper, please? Over to you. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you, Councillor Humby. And I would stress, although you rightly point out that I'm here as an opposition spokesman on most occasions, on this particular occasion, I'm also the cabinet member in Winchester City Council who has worked in partnership with Hampshire on this project. Uh, and I think it would be uh, remiss of me not to uh, reflect that in my comments. Um, first of all, obvious to say that uh, we support this. We support going out to consultation. It's the right moment in the process to listen. Uh, and I know from talking to officers uh, that they're of the view, and I know you and I are both of the view, that this is a how to make it better consultation, not a rubber stamping or a referendum on the proposals. And that's very much the mindset and approach that we have. There's a lot of interest in these proposals in Winchester. Um, I've shared versions of them and early versions of them with the local business improvement district. It's also been to the city council scrutiny committee and, and, and I appreciate the support of county officers in those meetings. It's a step in the process. It's not the end of the process. Um, there is other work going on which will strengthen these proposals further and for example mean that the county's uh, bus service improvement plan has uh, work coming out of the City of Winchester Movement Strategy that looks at how we can further improve bus services as well. Um, but this is, you know, this is the these are these are good proposals. The purpose of this consultation is to make them better. Um, we look forward to hearing the views of what stakeholders have to say, and I thoroughly endorse the decision to go out to the public and seek those views now because it's the right thing to do and. You know, we need to keep driving this agenda, not just to improve the air quality in the city centre, to improve the overall environment in the city centre, uh, and take a make a contribution to uh, to cutting carbon across the districts as well. So, thank you to all involved at Hampshire. I suppose I'm one of them, but all involved at Hampshire County Council for their very positive collaboration on this, and I look forward to seeing the results of the work. Martin, that's excellent. Thank you for that, and that was pretty well a very good summing up of what I'm going to do. So I won't repeat it. I think I, what I would like to say, though, um, it's very easy, to, as I said before, to get to a paper like this. This has been through an enormous lengthy process to get to this stage. 
So well done to the Wichita team as well as the county team, as you say, and to David and the team, David. So as I say, it's very easy to just sort of look at a paper like this and think, well, that's great. But it's been hours and hours and hours of work, lots of consultations, lots of meetings, and it was very, very positive. And as I say, thank you, Martin, for, for making those points as well. Um, I'm extremely pleased to see it going forward and looking forward to the consultation and the responses we get to that. So, so well done to you and the team. I don't think I have anybody else uh, wants to speak, unless uh, Councillor Oppenheimer would like to make a, a brief comment. No? Well, I, I'd just say that, you know, recently I've been getting more involved in the Winchester Movement Strategy and uh, I've very much enjoyed that and looking forward to working with Winchester as we take it forward. That's right, Russell, and thank you very much for that. And once again, David, well done to, to you and the team as well. So I have nothing further to add. So I'm very pleased to uh, accept the recommendations in Paris 2 to 4 on page 5, Katie. Thank you very much. OK, so we're going to go on to agenda item 2, which is the uh, project appraisal for Farnborough Growth Package, North Camp. And we do have Mr Mark Sullivan that is going to speak on this paper. So, Mr. Sullivan, if you are there and ready, would you like to uh, make your points on the paper first, please? Thank you very much. Hi, um, can, can you hear me? Yes, we can. That's perfect. Thank you. So, firstly, I'd very much like to thank the executive for the opportunity to speak today. Um, my name is Mark Sullivan, owner of Fish and Chip Shop uh, in Lynchwood Road. We've been trading into it since 2009. So the attraction for this site for us was the ease in the amount of parking, the through traffic um, on, along the carriageway and the strong local customer presence. But, but when I first heard of this scheme, my first question was, will the parking be affected? And I was sort of led to believe it wouldn't be. Unfortunately, I, I don't feel this is the case and I feel very strongly that I need to make representation in the hope that certain details can be changed. So I would firstly like to say that my business neighbours and I do have not have, do not have any problems with this scheme in principle along Lynchford Road. Um, it has been prone to pavement flooding and in desperate need of tidying up for many, many years. Um, so the fixing of these problems would be most welcome and can only improve the area. Um, but as we live and work in this area, I feel that we have a very good outlook to what goes on daily and maybe have a slightly different view on how things can be done. So again, having spoken to my neighbours, we have concerns about the cycleway. The fact that it has been built to a maximum width of three metres only adds to the fear that of speeding cyclists and the problems they can cause with pedestrians and the people using the local businesses on Lynchford Road. So I, I, I just put the question out there, you know, would it be possible to reduce this down to 2.5 or even two metres to help reduce the speed? I know there's been options in the past and I've seen them uh, to have a multi-use, i.e. pedestrians and a cycleway, but I'm sure that in this, this is not an ideal situation for this site. Uh, a question I'd like at some point to be answered, if it's OK, is if none of these suggestions are viable, then what would be the means of controlling cyclist speeds? For surely in this situation, pedestrians should take priority over the cycle lane. And I, you know, I do not really believe that there's the, the cycle lane would be used to its maximum capacity. So that, that's, that's the one point. Um, the second point is, and I've spoken about this before, is I'd like to move on about the design of the parking, if that's OK. Um, the new scheme, I believe, leaves us at least 10 parking spaces short of what we have today, which is, of course, equivalent to 30 spaces an hour. Uh, in your own consultation paper, 74% agreed with maintaining parking or ac and access to local businesses. This is a large part of the population realising the need for the parking to be protected. I believe the secret of the flow of traffic that along Lynchford Road was due to the fact, or partly to the fact, that the parking lane was uninterrupted, so people could move into that lane out of the flow of traffic, like either park straight away or move along that lane to a parking spot outside their chosen shop. 
so thus maintaining the flow of traffic smoothly. The new scheme, however, has trees in the parking bay. Um, uh, so there is two parking spaces between each tree pit. These tree pits will further reduce the parking already reduced by the scheme with the cycle path put in, cycle lanes put in, um, and will, to my mind, will slow down the uh, flow of traffic as people will find it a lot more difficult to get in and out of the parking spaces provided. Um, personally, um, and I travel around a lot, I've never seen the use of tree pits in parking lanes or laybys before, and I'm just wondering when this became the norm. Um, I also believe the tree pits will cause the parking base to be a lot more dangerous and eventually discourage people from using them. I realise the inclusion of the trees was twofold. Firstly, in the first draft of the plans, when there was going to be three or four lanes, we would, we would have lost the trees along the boundary of the MOD and these would need replacing. Obviously, that is not the case now as the existing trees will stay in situ. The second reason for the trees is, I believe, to aid in the drainage of surface water coming off the pavements. My suggestion, along with my neighbours in agreement with me, is not to have these trees reducing our parking when we can easily take them out of the plan and put in soakaways in their place to take away the surface water. This would maximise the space for parking and leave us with an uninterrupted parking lay-by as we now, as we operate today. Uh, it would be far easier to get in and out of the lay-by and would solve the problems of drainage and help with the reduction in parking within the scheme as we, as, as we find it today. Even though your scheme allows us at present, the scheme, 14 parking spaces, you have to take into account that there are four parking spaces being removed from the front of apartments on Lynchwood Road. It will be naive to think that those residents will now not use some of our 14 parking spaces we have left and that will reduce the parking even further. We have two takeaways, one restaurant, a convenience store that rely on those parking spaces in the evening to do their business. So looking at this plan in its present format, it seems to me that the businesses have taken a back seat to the pedestrians, which is rightly so, but the cyclists and the lobby for more trees. Surely this can't be right. Uh, we've all invested in North Camp, uh, the community, and we should be looked after within the scheme accordingly and not penalised as an easy target. Um, all I'm asking for today is that common sense and safety prevail with a balance in the scheme that suits absolutely everyone. Um, we have to accept in the long run that the parking will be reduced due to the, the cycleway. And um, that is, that is um, we know that's going to happen. But, um, but I have made I have made, I am concerned that um, we can put trees anywhere else. We can't, we can't create any more parking for our business. The trees are important, very important. Extra trees should be planted, but not at the expense of parking spaces uh, and, and businesses. So that, that's my main point. The trees can go anywhere. There's other places for these trees and um, we can do something with the drainage. Um, my last point um, is I don't know what any of your plans are uh, yet for construction. I don't even know if you do, but I, I would like to know if there's a possibility that the rear access to our buildings can be kept open because there are ways of doing business, um, um, a few of us along that road, um, we run a delivery service, for instance, which can be run from the back of the business if if uh, the fronts of the shop are, are, we have to close. I don't know what the situation is, but if we do have to close the businesses for a point of time, we can operate out the back backs of our businesses. Some of us can. We certainly could to a point. Um, and I think that would be um, really helpful if we could do that so we so we can maintain the access. Uh, obviously, it would help negate some of the losses. Uh, it will keep us in touch with our customers, um, and um, that would be very, very helpful. Um, just, just to finish off from my point of view, this is the third time I've had to make representations 
uh, for a reduction of parking outside one of my businesses. Uh, it just seems parking seems to be very cheap these days and the first thing that gets rid of. Um, I can tell you from my experience that in one case uh, it was catastrophic and destroyed my business and in the other uh, I, I happened, was very lucky enough to fight it and get some parking put back in which saved my business. Um, you know, our businesses are our lives. They are our pension schemes when we retire. We've all worked very hard over the years, like everyone does, to run a successful business. And I hope you look upon us kindly. So thank you very much for your time and listening to me. And all we ask is to be treated fairly within the scheme to maximise the parking space available for all of our businesses. Thank you very much. Mr Sullivan, thank you very much. And you make your point very well, very clear. So I appreciate the time that you spent doing that. You will know that I've visited the site on quite a few occasions and met myself. And I will at this point um, remind you also that Councillor Chad um, has raised that issue with me as well. And indeed, she is in the paper. I think it's on... Uh, I've got it in front of me. I've got it in front of me. I have got it in front of me. Right, okay. Yeah, no, so, sorry, but she's, um, she makes her points on power 36. What I'm going to do is ask the officer to present the paper. And as we go through that paper, so I can pick up those three points you make, but certainly on the cycling and the width and controlling the speed, the parking, which I've raised, and the construction, whether we know that, whether we can accommodate that, and that might be something in the future that they can have uh, discussions with you. Absolutely. But I'm going to let, um, I think it's Peter presenting now, to go through the report. So thank you very much for your presentation. And th there'll be no further opportunity to speak now, but we'll pick those up. And I'm always happy to speak at a later date as well, certainly through Councillor Chad, all the local members. So thank you, Mr Sullivan. So I'm going to ask Peter to uh, present the paper, I believe it is. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sutherland, for your comments. Um, I'll run through the paper and I'll try and pick up each of those points as they're raised, if that's okay, Councillor Humby. Would you? Be great. Please, thank I, you. I think there was a point about drainage and its management as well that needs to be put into context and some points about the parking as well. Okay. So, thank you, everyone. Good to see you today. Um, here just to present the paper. This paper is seeking authority to um, let a contract to take forward three elements of work within. North Camp, which are the um, the first phase of the Farnborough Growth Package, which is the Lynchford Road Improvement Scheme, and this is the easternmost section of that that relieves congestion, introduces cycling and walking facilities. Um, it, it also includes for Old Lynchford Road. Um, I beg your pardon, my battery is about to go down on my laptop. It includes Old Lynchford Road. Um, with some improvements to walking and cycling and some improvements to Alexandra Road as well. Um, this follows an earlier decision day in March to bring these schemes together within one package. It's been let as one contract so as we can manage the impact of the three schemes together as a whole scheme within the local community. So we have one site compound, we reduce the impact and we'd very much like to pick up on the comments that Mr Sullivan's raised about rear access as well. I don't believe that we've prejudiced that, but we'll come back and provide some answers to you about that as well. Um, we have developed this scheme, as Mr Sullivan noted, as a variation on schemes that were presented previously. That's to make sure that we still deliver the congestion improvements that are expected and that were submitted as part of the business case to the LEP to significantly reduce the environmental impact with the scheme that was developed previously, which was either with four lanes or three lanes running along Lynchford Road and to introduce walking and cycling facilities as they meet standards as they are at present, and in particular low standards that are set out in LGM 120, and with the duty to try and provide as much walking and cycling benefit as is practical in line with DFT guidance. Um, in terms of the points that have been raised, um, I'll try and go through them as they were brought up by Mr Sullivan. In terms of um, drainage and the urban realm at the moment the roof rainfall spill just lands on the pavement and isn't attenuated any form of drainage which should happen normally it's private drainage which should be allowed for and managed within uh, private property within this scheme we're taking on the impact of that rainfall and attenuating for it within the scheme that we are bringing forward we are making sure we provide resilience in the drainage network overall by providing for 
the attenuation that may be required for phase two to come forward for the Lynchford Road scheme, the wider scheme overall. Part of that attenuation is with um, attenuation crates that sit underneath the uh, catchment, the tree pits that are being provided within the, the parking bays. So it's part of an integrated solution that's been provided there, but it will improve the cycle, improve the general condition of the forecourt with a more active management of the uh, surface waters there and accommodation of that rainfall. Um, in terms of designing to LTN 120, which is the design guidance for walking and cycling, we have a three meter wide cycleway that's been provided. That's the desirable cycleway. And there were a lot of representations previously, Councillor, about accommodating that. And also quite a lot of representations in the uh, consultation exercise undertaken this year to have walking and cycling measures introduced all the way along um, Lynchford Road and Old Lynchford Road. Some strong views from the, the local school as well around that topic item. Um, so it's been designed to that standard. I must admit, I'm not aware as to how we can limit cycle speeds actively within there, um, but we could look at some of the conditions and the way in which we can manage cycle speeds as we um, finalise the, de the designs finalised to go out for um, tender. In terms of parking, there is a loss of some parking within the scheme. Um, that's to make sure that we deliver the congestion improvements and the capacity improvements that were originally envisaged. Um, there are four parking bays. Well, the parking bays are lost to the east of Morris Road. The change in parking provision is from 148 metres worth of parking along Lynchford Road to 115 metres of parking. We believe that leaves us with approximately 18 parking bays um, along there. We have undertaken some usage counts on the parking there at the moment as well. Um, and at the and we uh, data that we've received for that that was undertaken on the 15th of September this year shows that the maximum parking demand is for 17 vehicles, which is sometime between seven and eight o'clock in an evening. Um, and we have gone and undertaken some anecdotal surveys of parking at the time of takeaway operations, well, that we're happy to share and discuss somewhat further. Um, I think that deals with all of the points raised, which is access to facilities, the management of the public realm, the parking bay numbers that are being provided for, and the access to services as well. And I think just one final point to note, and, and it's Mr Sullivan's business, so he more clearly understands the needs of his business than, than we may do. But the, the anecdotal comments that we have from site visits is of people stopping as they travel eastbound at different points along Lynchford Road to see a space that's available and then walking from that space to get access into the um, to the facilities that have been provided there as well. And in terms of trees, so that was just the final point, wasn't it? And the general environmental benefit, obviously we're looking to try and provide a green corridor along here. That's part of how this, this sector of the network is designated. And that's why these trees were included for and the opportunity taken to take mutual drainage strategy has been adopted as well for these trees included within the, for, the forecourt and public realm along Lynchford Road. OK, Peter, thank you uh, very much. Just a couple of points I will comment on that then. In terms of the speed, you said that's something we can look at in terms of cycling. So I'd be interested to know um, how that progresses, if there is anything we can do, because this is not just for this scheme. That might come up in other areas. So yeah. I'd be interested to, to understand that. I think we also need to understand, for those that haven't been involved with this scheme for quite some time, um, we had an original plan for the scheme. We went out to consultation. And we have significantly changed the scheme, listening to that consultation and come back with a revised scheme. And as I said to Mr Sullivan, I visited you know, the site many times and met with the businesses as well as with the local members. Now, this always comes to a point where there is some sort of compromise between. And this is a package. You know, there are three sort of schemes going here. But what I would um, like to suggest, Peter, is that there's that ongoing dialogue with the local businesses certainly in terms of how the scheme is implemented and how we can manage that to assist the businesses in that process. 
I sure. take the point about the water and the water runoff, and we're picking up the responsibility on that. But that's still a discussion I can think, you know, that we can probably have. So I'm very keen that we keep that dialogue going with the businesses. But I think Mr. Sullivan makes some good points, but I, but but we need to keep discussing those and, and understanding it. Um, and as I say, going right back to the beginning, when that scheme was originally going to be, it was going to go across the other side of the road onto the MOD site and a significant loss of trees. And of course, that has now been amended. So that site or that area doesn't have to be, uh, there's no impact on that. I do think it's important to make that. Stuart, I don't know if you want to make a brief comment on this paper, please. I think just a general um, comment, really, um, Chairman, to the extent that really the agenda that we're working to these days is is about facilitating movement and ease of access in a sustainable way. Yeah. Um, and the reintroduction of trees in Hampshire is an important part of our climate change response, and it can provide not only amenity benefits to the local area, but, but also kind of genuinely help with things like air quality and, and other measures. So I don't think um, in answer to Mr. Sullivan's point that this, um, you know, that this is a kind of unique thing that's been brought forward. It's one of the early new um, transport schemes, which is incorporating street trees in a meaningful way in, into the environment and very much in line with the comments that local people made. I, I think also, Mr. Chairman, as you rightly observed, it, you know, all schemes like this are a compromise at some point. So, we think we've got the balance about right between kind of maintaining parking and um, the environment and traffic flow. I respect and understand Mr. Sullivan's points, but I think we just respectfully disagree that we've got the balance wrong in this case. Okay, thanks for that, Stuart, and, and that's very much appreciated. So, um, I, as I say, I'm, I'm uh, understanding of the issues always around the supporting local businesses, and Mr. Sullivan also made some good points. So what I am going to ask you is that the team keep in that dialogue with Mr Sullivan and the local businesses. And I'm just going to remind everybody that Councillor Chad did make those comments as well uh, along the similar lines and, as I say, other local members as well. So I want to make sure we keep that dialogue going and we address those issues as far as we possibly can. But I do agree, as I said, and you've repeated, Stuart, that this is a balance between that and there will always have to always have to be a compromise on that. So on that note, and bearing in mind, Peter, I'm going to say we keep that ongoing discussions and dialogue, and I would like to be kept informed of that and the process, and I'm sure my other colleagues um, and ETE would be as well. Certainly, uh, Councillor Oppenheim would be interested to understand those issues as well. Russell, do you want to make a very brief comment on that? Um, yeah, uh, just to say, you know, I've followed that discussion closely, and yes, I will be very interested in, in following up on it. Okay, that's great. Thank you. So, so on that note, and understanding those issues and the work I'd like to see in terms of that, that ongoing dialogue, um, uh, I'm very happy, uh, Katie, to accept the recommendations as set out in Paris 2 to 4 on page 19. Uh, Peter, thank you very much for that input and that report. And as I say, we'll keep in touch in terms of Mr Sullivan and the businesses and the local members as well on, on how that progresses. So thank you for that. OK, thank you very much. We will now move on to agenda item three, which is the ETE Capital Programme. And I think, Stuart, are you presenting this? You're on. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yes, Chairman, I, I am presenting this one. Um, and I think just to echo the comment you made on one of the earlier reports, I think it's important to note that this paper has been through a number of iterations before it's arrived today um, at this point. Um, and therefore, I will only briefly um, pick up the highlight points. Um, the key point really is that this is a, sh an, a summary of progress on the ET Capital Programme for the current year. I think the, the next update that comes before you will probably um, give more meaningful information about progress this year because we'll have a better idea at that point about what measures, uh, about what the like, outturn of the programme is. Um, but it Progress has been very good so far this year, and, and as paragraph 12 said, expenditure is about 72% higher than last year at the same stage um, this year, so we're over 37.5 million, which I think is, is very good progress. Um, planned expenditure for the year is about 152 million, you know, which is an enormous sum of capital spending and kind of represents a real high water market that we've been at in recent years on the amount of 
the council's investing in transport and highways um, in Hampshire, and uh, you know very much it reflects our success in attracting external funding um, for the capital programme. Um, the report highlights the need to increase values on some schemes, including the, the old Linford Road elements of the previous scheme that you referred to. Um, the, scheme or, the report also flags bids that we're currently waiting for confirmation of the outcome of government funding applications on, um, including the Active Travel Fund uh, Trans 3 programme and levelling up bids. I can say that on the levelling up programme, we haven't had a positive announcement on those yet, um, but we also haven't received a negative announcement. So some levelling up funding has been announced, but we kind of haven't had any formal communication on our bids. And whilst, uh, yeah, we're, so we're still awaiting that and there may well be further announcements made by central government. Um, and so we, I think, you know, the, the we haven't reached the end of the bid process on that, although clearly it's disappointing that we haven't had a, a positive announcement so far in any of the um, government funding announcements on that. Um, but we are waiting to hear the outcome of those bids. Um, the final point I wanted to just raise, Chairman, is that we're now beginning to see the impact of a, a whole series of measures which are starting to impact on the cost of construction projects in the UK. And that's everything from HGV driver shortages, worldwide shortage of construction materials as a result of the kind of shutdown of, of various industries in different parts of the country and the world during the, the um, coronavirus lockdowns. But also, there's a bit of a perfect storm of impact financially, including the increase in national insurance contributions, the um, re reduction of the ability to use red diesel um, for some of the, you know, for uh, construction projects, which was um, something that was done before. And we'll therefore expect to see further cost pressures working through into the capital programme. And I just felt it was important to bring this to your attention at this stage because I think that will become a feature of the capital program going forward that it will become more expensive to do the same things. Sorry you're muted Councillor Humby. Oh yes you muted me. Um, I, apparently I'm echoing. I have nothing else running. I can't do anything about that so I do apologise. Um, you have to tell me when you've muted me, Katie. Um, Russell, uh, Stuart, thank you very much for that and for pointing out those points. Um, Russell, would you just like to uh, make a few points on this paper that directly affects us as well? Yes, I just want to say that reading through the paper, what really strikes me is what a good balance we've got between structural maintenance and integrated transport and casualty reduction and walking and cycling schemes. We obviously hope we're going to be very successful in our bids, um, such as the levelling up and the active travel. But in the meantime, we are spending capital on good schemes across the county that, that are going to benefit communities. And uh, I think it's an excellent programme. Thank you, Russell. So I'd just like to make the point, it's one of those frustrating papers that you look at, um, you know, you don't have a great deal of discussion on it. It's an enormous paper, and I'll just like to say, I mean, that capital program in these challenging times is extremely impressive. So Stuart, I'd like you to take that back, you know, to, to well done to you and the whole team for that. And as Russell said, and the spread of work that has been done as well. Um, it's been through, as you said, many iterations. We've had endless discussions and meetings on it, but to get to that scale of program in these challenging times, noting what you said, Stuart, in terms of those potential for the additional costs, and future challenges that are come, again, they're going to come because of that. So I'm extremely pleased with it. So please take that back to the whole team, right across the whole department and all those involved as well. It's it's extremely impressive, but it's very difficult for people that have only just sort of joined and come from sort of, if you like, looking on the, on the fringes of this to understand how impressive you know that is for the for the whole department. So thank you for that. Um, as Joe, did you want to say something else? Sorry. Was that just um, really to put it in context, exactly as you say, um, Councillor Humby, that this is 150% of the revenue budget that the department spends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, well, thank you for that. So, um, Katie, I'm very happy to accept the recommendations that set out in Paris 2 to 4 on pages 53. Thank you. 
Okay, so we're going to go on to agenda item four, which is the Waterside, the A326. And we have uh, Mr. Philip Thomas is going to speak uh, first. So, Mr. Thomas, are you there? And are you happy to make your presentation now? Just need to unmute, Mr. Thomas. Hello. Can you hear me? All I can hear is a big echo, which I can hear now you have. Mr. Thomas, before you speak, I think you might have two devices and I think you might need to try and mute one of them. We're getting terrible feedback and we won't be able to hear you. I don't know if Katie can assist. Sorry, I missed. Can someone else talk? I, I think you're using the, the camera on one of your devices and the microphone on the other. Okay, so you're muted now, Mr. Thomas. So the one, if you, the the one that you're facing with the camera, if you unmute on on that one, then we should be able to hear you a bit better. Hopefully in the top right of the screen that you're facing now, there should be a microphone symbol with a with a line through it, a diagonal line. If you press that, then it should unmute you. That's better. There we are. Right, what I've done is I've come out to the whole thing and started up again. I had a terrible echo all the way through. Uh, I had difficulty coming in uh, to start the whole shooting match um, before two o'clock. I'm sorry about that. Uh, I give my talk now. Yes, please, Mr. Thomas. Thank right. you. Oh, that's right. So, thank you very much. Dear councillors, may I thank you for giving me the opportunity to make this deputation regarding option two of the A326 North improvements. My name is Philip Thomas. I am giving this deputation on behalf of the Waterside Cycling Action Group, a group of cyclists who are connect concerned with the safe crossings of the A326 and the development of safe cycle routes within the waterside. We have responded to both the LC WIP and the Transforming Cycle Cities Fund consultations within the waterside. We have already stated our views regarding option two in our responses to the various consult consult consultations already mentioned. We note that this option being promoted is primarily concerned with increasing the capacity of the A326 for motor vehicles. We have no interest in promoting cycling on the A326 carriageway, other than the ability to cross over it safely at logical points to give access to and from the new forest. However, we do have an interest in being able to follow its alignment closely as it offers the most direct access for cyclists to all the waterside parishes. We support with caveats the proposed new cycle path alongside the A326 between the Pilgrim Inn and Dibden Roundabout, details of which we have seen in various drawings placed on the website appertaining to this development. This cycle path must be fully complement with LTN 120 standards. We feel that the omission to mention the proposed new cycle path between the Dibden Roundabout and the Pilgrim Inn in all three options is regrettable. We note that with the enlargement of the military port and the proposed creation of the free port in Marchwood, there will be an increased, uh, an expected increase in employees. Some of these employees will need to travel from the waterside south of Marchwood, and the obvious route for many is along Main Road, thus increasing the capacity of this route to the expanded port to the detriment of vulnerable road users. With the development of this port in mind, we feel that the development of the cycle path between the Pilgrim Inn and the Dibden Roundabout is of paramount importance to protect cyclists wishing to travel along main road between these two destinations. Junction improvements. Netley Marsh Roundabout. 
In addition to the controlled pedestrian crossing, it should accommodate cyclists. Staplewood Lane. We believe that the installation of junction traffic signals will be of benefit to Matchwood, especially concerning the new housing development proposed in the area north of the village. The right-hand turn option could then be reinstated. This would reduce the need for traffic to use Trots Lane to travel north to Southampton, which would leave this route as a safe, al safe alternative cycling route to the one through the centre of Marchwood, as proposed in the LC Whip and TCF. This would also help cyclists to access the new forest and ashes to the west of the A326. Twigs Lane. The existing Toucan crossing of the A326 just to the south of the junction is used by significant numbers of cyclists and it allows parents to park on the western side of the A326 and walk their children across the road to the school rather than having to drive into Twigs Lane, adding to the present chaotic situation. The provision of traffic signals at the Staplewood Lane junction with all movements permitted would also help reduce the pressures on Twigs Lane past the school and reduce the need to provide full signals controlled lights at the Twigs Lane junction. This could also assist in the development of active travel for the school journey. By introducing a timed school streets scheme, by having vehicle free zones at school start and finish, time, finish times, and would provide a safer environment around the school. Consideration should be made concerning the levels of traffic on Twigs Lane by referring to the present experiment of closing off streets around three schools in the county. We are happy to note that by rejecting option three, the generation of car usage will be lessened and option two will reduce the need to use parallel north-south routes by motor vehicles wishing to avoid the A326. The need to increase cycling and walking facilities to allow safe crossing of the A326 and to travel safely in a north-south direction within the waterside will also lower the production of carbon dioxide, which is within the commitment of the government to reach net zero. The continued use of the Hythe ferry must be supported to help reduce the use of the car. The ferry is a great benefit for cyclists as they can take the bicycle into Southampton and then use it to cycle to various destinations in and around the city without having to resort to the car or public transport, which may not access those destinations so easily. I commuted to Eastleigh College by bicycle by this means for some 26 years. Thank you for the opportunity to make this deputation. Sorry, Councillor Humber, you're muted. <laughs> I do apologise. I'm as bad as everybody else now. Mr Thomas, I apologise for that. Um, thank you very much uh, for presenting that and certainly for the interest you've shown in this scheme. Um, we've had a lot of correspondence in the past and the amount of detailed work that you've done on that, that is uh, generally appreciated. What I'm going to do now, there'd be no further uh, chance for you to speak again, Mr Thomas, but I am going to ask the officer to present the paper to pick up as many of those points that you have made. Um, what I'm going to do, um, if that's OK, so thank you, Mr Thomas, um, Councillor Wayne and Councillor Todd, what I thought I would do is ask Jason to uh, present the paper and then ask you then to come and make your points after that, if that's OK, and then pick up any further points that you make. Malcolm, uh, do you want to speak? If you really wanted to speak now, that's fine, but I think that might be the best way to do it, if you're OK with that. Uh, Chairman, I, I will bow to your uh, wishes. Uh, whatever uh, it, it makes this a better discussion, I will go with. Uh, but I will uh, read out some points. Uh, uh, that I don't think I've been addressed by the paper. Uh, and can I say, I think Mr. Thomas's presentation was very good as well, if you don't mind. Absolutely, worry. yeah. So, so if, it's, uh, if it's OK, I'm going to ask Jason to present the paper, to pick up as many points as possible. Yourself and then Councillor Todd can make their points, and then I'll go back to Jason or Stuart to address any of those issues where we can. So over to you, uh, Jason, please. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Humby. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So I'll just give a really quick uh, sort of introduction to the paper. So the County Council have been um, considering A326 improvements on this section for, for a few years now. 
kind of started back in 2017 with a waterside transport study and a kind of interim policy position. Um, and, and a couple of years later, in summer 2019, um, transport for the southeast prioritised uh, Hampshire County Council's yeah. submission for A326 improvements um, to government as part of the large local majors fund. So subsequent to that, um, we were then invited to submit a strategic outline business case for those improvements by the government in March 2020. And since that time, we've been working on um, tra transport modelling, kind of design, early design and constraints work to identify three kind of principal options, um, which were presented in the public consultation over the summer this year, and also formed part of the strategic outline business case that was submitted uh, to the DFT in July of this year. Um, so this paper really is about um, getting the, the necessary approvals in place really to enable um, the County Council to progress the feasibility design for the improvements um, as and when the SOBC is approved by the DFT. Currently, it's currently still waiting for that uh, to occur. So the main recommendation is around approval of option two uh, that was consulted on uh, in the summer as the one to take forward um, to feasibility design for various reasons, kind of drawing on on some of the consultation feedback from the summer uh, and a number of other uh, reasons why we feel that option two is, is the most future one to take forward compared to the other two options that were presented. Um, overall, we think it provides the kind of best balance between um, achieving the objectives of the scheme that we've set out and kind of minimising the, the environmental impact while still providing an increase in, in traffic capacity. Um, so yeah, to 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 kind of pick up on some of uh, Mr Thomas's comments really around cycling. Uh, first thing to say is that yes, um, we very much at all these sort of cycle facilities that uh, form part of the scheme will be compliant with the latest guidance issued by government LTN 120 uh, and the section of path obviously that you alluded to between main road and, and the pilgrim inn will be designed in accordance with that and, and will very much form part of, of the scheme that's taken forward as will um, improved crossing provision for pedestrians and cyclists at the key junctions. Uh, it won't just be limited to, to the Netley Marsh Junction. We're really looking to uh, incorporate improved crossing provision of the A326 um, at, at key points, really. That's one of the sort of um, things that we're really trying to achieve with the scheme is to reduce as far as we can, really, the barrier that, that can be posed by, by the busy road and, and kind of access between the communities and the new forest. Uh, and yeah, we take, certainly take the points as well that you raised around around Twigs Lane and Staplewood Road. We, you know, we've got a low, uh, an awful lot of work still to do on this scheme. I think it's important to emphasise we are at a very early stage where we will be starting feasibility design. So all these kind of detailed issues in terms of exactly what the junctions are going to look like and how we incorporate uh, crossing provision will be considered in, in detail over the next phase of work uh, as and when we are effectively given approval to go ahead and, and do that. I think that's probably yeah, we'll see Councillor Humby. Oh, well, I didn't do it that time. Um, no, I didn't. <laughs> OK, apologies, everybody. Jason, thank you uh, very much and certainly for picking up um, as many points as you could then. And an important point about saying a lot of it is work in progress, a lot of those issues to be addressed. What I'm going to do now, uh, Councillor Wade Malcolm, is come to you and then let Councillor Todd speak, and then I'll go back to Jason and Stuart after that. So, so Malcolm, over to you, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and thank you for allowing me to address the committee on this issue. Um, my my, uh, my concerns fall into two categories. The needs of local people and the wider environment to enter issues. Now, in context, the Waterside Air de New Forest, east of the A326, is facing the largest amount of development since the, district, since the industrial boom in South Waterside in the mid-20th century. And this impacts development on both the environment and local people in a very, very big way. Looking at the environment from a personal perspective, Hampshire County Council, as we know, has declared a climate emergency. We've just had COP26 to reduce carbon emissions and we're producing a local transport plan that has that very desire in mind how we can become greener. So this decision, what is this particular decision doing for the environment in that context? 
It says in short, and I quote from the report, uh, the, in the medium term, bus walking and cycle improvements will be developed, focusing on making bus services quicker and more reliable, connecting the waterside settlements and the national park by improving the quality of pedestrian environment for day to day trips and direct cycle corridor. No more. The rest is all about motor vehicles, redistributing them on the A326. There is nothing substantial about reducing the number of vehicles needing to use that road and providing alternative options. Millions will be spent on the A326, but what about the carbon reduction spending, that money on alternative methods of transport, by reducing the need for so much money on a road improvement? Yes, Waterside Rail looks like it's coming, but it might need further investment to meet its real potential. Bus services could be improved vastly in connections with the rest of the New Forest, not just the Waterside communities in Southampton. There are very, very, in fact, it's one bus that goes from the, from, from the Waterside to, to Limington, and, and that's it, really, apart from so many, many run in the summer. Bus services uh, uh, could be improved. But more, more a point. More to the point, the, the council's not using its imagination in innovative ways to deal with taking traffic off the A326. The high ferry is seen as a tourist boat by officers, and I've had that discussion many times. You will know that, Chairman, because I'm a great supporter of the ferry. But where is the imagination to help develop this service into a true water taxi? It is the quickest and safest route, as Mr Phillips identified, in for cyclists to get to Southampton. And it still is a commuter used by commuters and it can't, could be developed further. Uh, we could increase the number of ferries, bringing back effective connecting bus services, part of a more joined up transport concept, again, to take vehicles off that road. The, the plan's not really green enough. Uh, and I understand the scheme can't be run through the carbon mitigation tool because it's not detailed enough. Understand that totally. But shouldn't we really take that into, 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 into greater context having facts and figures before looking at an optimistic prediction. However, Chairman, I suppose the biggest impact, and I speak on behalf of local local residents, uh, the population of Hive and Dibden and along that with South Waterside have put up with congestion on the A326 for years. It has been described as the longest, most congested cul-de-sac in Hampshire. Yet option two will not solve that situation. I've challenged traffic engineers numerous times who always say the A326 is only congested north of Marchwood, but little traffic joins it north of Mar from Marchwood. It's all of that traffic from the two communities south of Marchwood. I personally I have used that road nearly every day of my uh, working life and can personally attest that convoy traffic exists every day and not just at rush hour. That can be any time of the day with HG tra HGV traffic to and from not only the largest refinery in the United Kingdom, but the surrounding industry. And those industries contribute so much to business rates that they do not have an adequate transport link beyond a single carriageway in each direction. It is no wonder that without any alternative strategy to taking cars off the road, option three was the most popular option uh, with, with the people in the consultation. But the paper doesn't address the 30,000 extra vehicle movements a day from the Fawley development or the 500 extra HGV movements from Marchwood Port. And this isn't talking about the three port. This is the existing development of military port we'll have by the end of the decade. The former being addressed, but, but they have so sort of addressed by the hugely unpopular, and I mean that with local people, moundabout modifications. They may well increase traffic flow north to south and south to north, but they do nothing for getting across. I know uh, Mr. Tipler has mentioned there will be some uh, um, some, some crotty points, uh, and um, we look forward to them coming. But cyclists want to go round the roundabout, and it's not safe for them to cross with speeding traffic at this juncture. And very many people, horse riders and pedestrians, cross the forest, uh, and they, they at the moment dodge the traffic. Uh, I suspect uh, unless we have multiple, which has been possible, sections, that will still continue. Um, but more to the point, Chairman, uh, Main Road, another issue uh, that, that is quite a consider for cyclists and indeed people, is this will send more traffic along Main Road Dibden, 
This runs alongside the A326. It's already used as a rat run uh, to, to miss the A326 convoy traffic and is also the cycle route that Mr. Philip, uh, Mr. Philip Thomas, Mr. Thomas has talked about. Um, so not only will dueling, um, not only by not dueling at Totten mean that this road by use even more, but the negative effect on the residents, but also on the cyclists and their, their safety, particularly at the crossing point at Dibden Roundabout, which is the entrance to this parallel route. Um, that's the people take to escape the queue. However, the significant move to cater for associated British port development on Dibden Bay, Marchwood, has but two lines in this report. Port expansion at APV Strategic Land Reserve, SLR, should be increased access directly from the A326 by the shortest leaked impactful route. Impact for who, uh, one might say, the APB or local residents? I suspect the former, because a roundabout in the A326 uh, from, from, from Dibden Bay, Marchwood, or any formal junction, which I, I understand why it is needed, but that will significantly affect traffic loads on the A326 south of that junction. And it must be a lot easier putting a junction than option two than a dual carriageway having a junction. Despite the cost implications, I can help thinking the threats of business are overtaking the interests of local people here because the road, road user's opinion has been ignored uh, and the narrative uh, compiled to this partial solution will not benefit local people so if of Totten. In summary, if this council uses its imagination to work on non-highway alternatives, we would not need to spend so much uh, on options to improve the A236. We would not need to upset the residents of Totten by having a dual carriageway at the bottom of their gardens. We could reduce convoy traffic from Hive and Forley and improve traffic flows for local residents by reducing the number of vehicles on the road. But if we stick with the same old solution, and this has just come up in the report, you get the same old problem. Bigger the road, the more cars will go on it. But there, there are to be 30,000 extra road movements by 2032 from Forley. Uh, let alone the lorry movements from Marchwood. So we will need a bigger road. Um, that is obvious. Finally, if there's no alternative to road movements, please we should consider the increasing, the soon to be increased number of residents south of Totten and the business and the HGVs and give them a road improvement that works. Do not subject them to stand sitting in their vehicles, increasing carbon emissions, queuing on a single carriageway south of Totten. Let's let's look regrettably if we can't invest in more ways to take people out of their cars, we need to look at perhaps option three. Uh, and Chairman, I, I say this, and I, I totally understand why the officers have picked option two. But I say this on behalf of the 40 plus thousand residents that, that live south of Totten. In fact, more, it's probably 50,000 including Marchwood. Uh, and uh, and the, 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 the real discord they have in, in using the A326 on a daily basis without a viable alternative. Uh, and I can only see that, that their, their pain getting worse if we go to option uh, three, top three, option two. Thank you very much. Malcolm, thank you very much. And uh, again, thank you for the amount of time and effort you put into that. And it's, uh, you made your points very clear and passionately as well and understand what you do. Um, lots of points there, but I am going to go straight to Councillor Todd, if that's OK, and then ask Jason and maybe Stuart to address some of those issues as we go forward. Councillor Todd, Martin, over to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much indeed, uh, uh, Councillor Humby. For obvious reasons, I can but support the overall points made by my colleague, uh, Councillor Wade. Um, I think my concern with what's in front of us today is it, it, it feels like the death throes of predict and provide. Uh, an approach that I know in LTP4 we're looking to move away from, which talks much more about how we manage traffic, manage journeys, give people better alternatives. You know, when you look at those multi-lane highways that you end up in the US, every lane has been added. Every extra traffic function has been added in the expectation that it will somehow magically make congestion go away. Uh, and then you look at the image of these sort of 25 lane highways. And I realize that's not what you're proposing. And they probably don't have 25 lanes either, probably 10 or something. Uh, and they're still absolutely jammed because 
um, but I, I don't think enough account is being taken of the way in which building extra capacity generates extra journeys. And in the context of the climate change agenda and the fact that we can't electrify our way out of carbon emissions from transport, that is very problematic. So uh, my, my concern is that we're not reflecting the, the emerging thinking, the best thinking about how we manage situations like this. Um, there were a lot of good points made about what could be done uh, to support active travel, particularly cycling in terms of uh, future development and thinking about the scheme. And a lot of good points made about the importance of enabling public transport, whether that's uh, by a bus, train, ferry or even water taxi, um, as, as Councillor Wade has highlighted. So I, I would support the point that he's made in terms of the concern that he has about how this is construed and the lack of the, the need for far greater focus on finding ways to manage these journeys through other routes and not be at a time of climate emergency fueling extra journeys which will make it harder for us to achieve the net zero goals that we all know are incredibly important. Martin, thank you very much and appreciate that and understand those comments as well. Um, I'm going to go to you first, Jason, to see if we address some of those issues and perhaps uh, uh, refer to Stuart after that, if that's OK. So, Jason, would you like to pick up some of those points, specifically on Councillor Wade's points earlier? Uh, Chairman, Jason's actually had to leave the meeting because he's got a childcare um, issue. Uh, apologies for that, but Frank has been listening in on the conversation and Frank's with us and perhaps I could ask Frank to pick up some of those and, and then I'll um, add my two pennies. OK, apologies, I hadn't realised. Yes, thank you, Frank. Certainly, Stuart. Thank you very much. Um, I think the first thing to, to say with Council is that Councillor Wade has correctly identified the huge complexity that applies to developing a waterside transport strategy and considering all the multimodal aspects of transport on the waterside. I think um, I'd also like to say that that is likely to be a subject of a future report, which is going to be summarising the consultation that we've been going into to identify the preferred transport strategy rather than preferred scheme as we are here for the road scheme uh, for the whole of the waterside, which will include consideration of the ferry issues, the cycling, bus access, bus priority, etc. Um, just to give you some additional background on that as well, in terms of the alternative modes, we do have the Transforming Cities Fund package, which is also being delivered as we speak, or being developed in detailed design on the waterside, which includes considerable investment in cycle facilities and considerable investment in bus-based priority measures to be implemented on the A326. So I think we do recognise that complexity. We are looking to develop a strategy and I think what the issues Councillor Way raised today will be the very same issues that we'll be covering off in that strategy going forward. I'd just like to remind the committee of the recommendations in the report, which are effectively, one is an administrative one, which is basically to put us in a position where if we are successful, then we can move quickly to progressing design work, feasibility design work, which means we are at a stage where we are prepared to listen and take into account any of the views raised by the community or any of the action groups that, that wish to tell us what they would like to see happen. We do absolutely recognise that the one of the biggest priorities that we need to do when and if we improve the A326 and if we are successful is actually to tackle the issue of severance caused by the A326 and we do accept that. I think um, the rest of the paper talks about various pros and cons of options one, two and three. And I think in light of the comments raised about whether this is the right time with COP26 and everything else going on, I think if we'd been in a, a predict and provide environment, we'd have opted for option three. And I think option two is a very pragmatic approach towards balancing both the climate and environmental issues against the needs for economic recovery growth and uh, other issues that apply in the water site. So I think, Councillor I'll, I'll stop there and I hope that that's answered the questions that have been raised.
Yeah, you have very well. Thank you very much and appreciate that. Stuart, I'm going to go to you next, please. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. I, I, I think Frank Sun did up really well. I, I, I mean, listening to Mr. Thomas, I felt we were talking the same language. Um, I think the County Council get that whole point about the severance impact, about the importance of the alternative routes to the A326 being as amenable um, to cyclists and pedestrians as possible. Um, we, we also get the fact that there is a very well-known and long-established congestion problem on the northern section of the A326, as Councillor Wade um, very eloquently said. Uh, and I, I endorse the point Frank made. If we were doing predict and provide, then we'd be going for option three, uh, and we're not because we're trying to move away from that. But we can't bury our heads in the sand as well. And, you know, imagination alone won't make all of that traffic movement go away. It's vital to the economy and vital to the success of the waterside communities. What we have to do is to come forward with this fully balanced package. And I accept that part of the problem is that we're talking here about preferred options for the road scheme, whereas, as Frank alluded to, there's a whole other lot of work going on. And a recent earlier decision day, you considered the um, case for the reopening of the passenger rail services on the railway line at the waterside. It's all part of the same equation. And I think if I can sum up overall, the County Council's approach is here to concentrate on trying to make the strategic route as fit for purpose as we can so that we attract most of the vehicular traffic onto that route that needs to use it. Um, but to see that in the context of a multi-million pound investment being planned for walking, cycling and public transport um, across the waterside area, which needs to be seen as a whole um, package. And, and I am confident that a lot of the points, particularly the detailed points that Mr Thomas made, but also Councillor Wade made, will be picked up as we can take forward the full package of measures and indeed the detailed design of the individual junctions and the components of the A326 North Improvement Scheme. Stuart, thank you very much. Appreciate it. I'm just going to quickly go to Council Oppenheim and might want to pick up a few points on the cycling uh, points that, that were made earlier, Russell. Yes, I would. Thank you, Chairman. And uh, I also wanted to take the opportunity to respond to Philip Thomas, who mentioned school streets in his deputation. We've actually got a decision on school streets coming up later today in my decision day. Um, we'll have to see what happens with that and how the scheme goes on. But what I would say is that the full commitment of the school and the school community seems to be quite crucial. Um, but if if we do extend the school street scheme, then it's certainly something we would look at in the future. Um, look, I think it's great that Waterside is getting this attention and this focus. It's a very special area. It needs it needs a lot of thought. What I would want to reassure uh, Councillor Wade and Councillor Todd about is that no no one's views will be ignored. Um, that you know everything is subject to consultation, and in my experience of Hampshire County Council, we look very closely at every response we get uh, when we do consultations. But absolutely, I endorse what what the officers have said that we need a balanced package, and. Uh, Walking and cycling is certainly going to be a big part of that. And uh, the climate impacts are certainly going to be taken into account. Um, so thank you very much for the opportunity to comment. Thank you very much. So, uh, Councillor Wade, Councillor Todd, I think listening to what um, Frank and um, Stuart have said, I, um, Malcolm, you made the point about how complicated it is, and I understand that. But you've also heard there is a bigger picture here as well in terms of the overall strategy. So what I'm going to, what I'm going to do, I'm going to accept the paper as it's set out, uh, Katie, uh, Paris 2 to 3 on page 69, but also make that commitment to Councillor Wade that we will keep in touch with you in terms of, and if necessary, organising some extra officer time for you to make those points so that when we have those wider discussions that you are fully involved with that. Um, and I understand the issues you make. I know the passion behind it and everything else. But I do think, um, and I, you know, you sort of make the points of no imagination. I think if you listen to what Frank and Stuart have said, there is. We are trying to address those issues. It's a much bigger picture at stake here. And we are trying to future proof as well. So with that, Councillor Wade and, and, and Councillor Todd, if you're happy with that, 
I'm going to accept the recommendations, as I said, but we will make sure we keep that consultation and keep you fully involved in that process. Councillor Wade, I know you want to speak. I'll just let you very quickly come back and make a very quick comment. I wouldn't normally do that, but I can see you want to say just a brief comment. Uh, very briefly, Chairman, oh, thank you for that, uh, that offer. Uh, but I am here as an advocate yep. for the people of the waterside and I want the best deal for them, both from an environmental perspective and, and for their ease of, 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 of life going forward. And that's and, and that's what I hope we can work yep. to achieve. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for that, Malcolm. And that is appreciated. And I'll make sure that that does happen. So thank you. Um, so thank you, Frank, as well, for that input. Um, so I'll just repeat, Katie, just to be absolutely clear, that accepts the recommendations in Paris 2 to 3 on page 69, Katie. Thank you very much. OK, we have uh, in my session, uh, last agenda item, agenda item five. And I think, Stuart, you're presenting that one. Yes, Chairman, I am. And I'm off mute before I started trying to do it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, OK, thank you. No, no, that was, it's usually me that's doing it while I'm muted. And this is just an update on the uh, Portsmouth and South East TCF project. Yeah. Um, Chairman, I know you've been through the report and know, know the details on this one, and I know you've taken a close personal interest in both the Southampton-based um, and the Portsmouth-based TCF project. Yeah. Um, the, uh, this report is largely, seek, is largely procedural in seeking permission um, and uh, a mandate to take forward some of the land assembly, some of the kind of more detailed arrangements necessary um, to progress both the gospel into scheme but also some of the other projects in the uh, Portsmouth and South East Hampshire and um, TCF package. Um, I think um, it's good progress but the TCF package as a whole comes with a deadline to spend government funding or we yeah. lose it. It's yeah. important to keep the momentum up and the, the report today takes another step forward if you, if you approve the measures as recommended Chairman. Yeah, thank you, Stuart. Um, yes, I've been closely involved with this one and the Southampton one, and I'm really pleased to see this progressing. Um, we do also have the same issues we have, say, in the capital programme, just to keep an eye on those costs as they've been rising all the way through and to make sure we manage that and which schemes are prioritised. Um, I will just read out a note that Councillor Burgess said to me, um, and I quote, I thank Hampshire County Councillor um, uh, Graham Burgess for his email fully supporting the aim of the Transforming Cities Fund and the Gosport Transport Interchange Improvements, which he feels will make a huge difference for Gosport and allow further work to be undertaken to improve the accessibility to the area. So Councillor Burgess sent that note to me earlier as, as leader of Gosport, and I was very grateful to receive that. Um, I'm just going to quickly go to Councillor Philpot. I don't know if Councillor Philpot, I know he's taken a keen interest in this, whether you wanted to make a brief comment on this. Um, when he's found the unmute button, of course. I'm very experienced. It took, me, it took, took me a while. Sorry, sorry, Chairman. I wasn't expecting that. Uh, there's, an awful, there's an awful lot of positive things I could say about this report, but uh, I, I'm going to refrain from doing so because a double hatter on Gospel Borough Council, but thank you very much for the opportunity anyway. OK, so when I'm in the chair, Councillor Philpott, always be prepared, like Councillor Russell Oppenheimer is going to be, because he might like to make a quick comment on this and being involved with it as well. Russell. I, I fully support the recommendations in the paper, is all I want to say. OK, that's excellent. That worked well then. OK, so I fully support the recommendations in Paris 2 to 6 on page 84, Katie. Right, OK, so within this session, that brings to the close my part of this and my D-Day. I'm now going to hand over to Councillor Russell Oppenheimer for his part of this session and his D-Day. Councillor Oppenheimer, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Humby. So yes, I'm Russell Oppenheimer. I'm executive member for Highways Operations. And uh, I'd like to thank you for attending my virtual decision day today, which continues to be webcast on YouTube via the County Council website. There are no deputations today, so I am going to proceed to item six, Network Rail Campbell Road Bridge. And uh, I'd like to ask Stuart Jarvis to introduce this item, please. Thank you very much, Chairman. 
Um, yes, the report for uh, on Campbell Road Bridge is seeking approval to spend up to £1.14 million during the next financial year to enable Campbell Road Bridge in Eastley, which is the network rail owned bridge over the railway line, but is the only connection between the residential community and the businesses um, and the, the kind of wider road network. And the proposal is to um, authorise this spending to go ahead to um, augment the network rail scheme to increase the or to um, strengthen the bridge. The, the addition of the county council funding will allow the bridge to be fully strengthened up to the maximum permitted weight requirement on, at the moment in the UK, which will mean that residents and the businesses in the area will be able to continue to enjoy full access um, as a result of keeping this single point of access um, up to the maximum standard. If the county council didn't intervene in this, then this, the bridge wouldn't be strengthened to um, that full weight limit, which may have implications for both businesses in terms of access by larger vehicles, but that may also have an impact on kind of residential services um, as a result of uh, limitations on vehicle weights. So it was felt that this is the right thing to do. Um, I um, will also undertake them. I mean, it is a complicated structure, um, and we will do our best to also try to accommodate um, improved residential um, uh, sort of pedestrian um, amenity and possibly for cyclists as well on it. But the, there's little that can be done given the width of the bridge deck, um, and the, the primary person purpose of the report is to get the, the funding to strengthen it structurally and um, the cost that's quoted is a maximum cost and in the event that other um, works come forward to be undertaken on that stretch of the railway line at the same time then the possession costs for the railway line would be shared in which case the um, extent of the county council's funding contribution to the project would be um, significantly reduced in the event that even if one other and project comes forward or one other scheme of work on that stretch of railway line at the same time. And um, so this is a maximum provision, but it's felt prudent to make that provision. Um, and finally, Chairman, just to say that the County Council is able to make this investment because of the success of an innovative um, scheme that we used to target costing on the Redbridge Causeway bridge improvement, which actually meant that the scheme has um, come in under the costs that were originally expected and that money can now be applied to this project also within the structural maintenance program and so effectively uh, allow the Campbell Road bridge improvement to go ahead without additional kind of demand on the capital program um, that, that wasn't sort of made at the beginning of the year because it can be funded from money that had already been set aside for Redbridge Causeway. Thank you, Stuart. Um, that's very clear. And uh, the paper was very clear and it was actually very useful having the photographs in that paper as well, which illustrate the issue. Um, let's see if anyone has any comments. Uh, Councillor Todd, would you like to comment? Um, yes, I spoke about I spoke with the local uh, division member, Councillor Park, about this and, uh, and, and we're sort of of like mind in the sense that Obviously, it makes sense to get the strengthening in place and, and to future proof the bridge as far as um, HGVs are concerned and the use of that uh, employment area. Um, the concern remains and the disappointment is that we're not able to make improvements to the um, pedestrian and cycling infrastructure at the same time. Um, and, you know, while it is but because of the nature of the business in that area it is important that large vehicles are able to use it you know we we are trying to encourage commuter journeys and other journeys uh to be done via sustainable means um and would want that that need is looked at uh, and continues to we continue to try and find ways to improve uh, in as far as is possible, connectivity. I mean, it, it is a singularly difficult situation. We recognise that, um, but uh, you know, if we look to the to the future, uh, we're not going to live in a world without HGVs. 
but we do always need to be pushing as far as we can to support active travel, walking and cycling. And so I know it's the view of the division member and it's also the, my view uh, that it's a shame that we've not been able to do it at this point, but that we should keep uh, this in scope as we look at uh, transport infrastructure in the area and find ways to improve it, if at all possible. Thank you, Councillor Todd. Um, in response, I will say that's noted and I agree we should look at making improvements in the area in the future. I don't think it affects this decision because this is quite a specific decision about spending to allow network rail to increase their strengthening project, um, which I think we all agree is, is a sensible rationale. Um, so your comments, I think, are noted and, uh, you know, we do want to improve walking and cycling in this area as we do across Hampshire um, and improve connectivity and give people those options. Um, but in terms of this decision, I'd like to accept the recommendations on page 101, paragraphs two to four, please, Katie. Thank you. And we'll move on then to item seven, publication of the concessionary travel scheme. Starting on page 109. And Stuart, are you going to introduce this item today, please? I am chairman. Yes, um, very briefly, because I think this is a relatively straightforward matter. Every year, the county council is required to publish the concessionary travel proposals for the that will apply in the following year. We have to do that by December. Um, so this uh, this report seeks your approval. Nothing changes in the concessionary travel scheme overall, Chairman, with one exception, and that is to return to the scheme that existed before the sort of temporary emergency measures that were put in place during the lockdown in relation to the period um, uh, uh, over which time consideration was given to about automatic past renewals and so on. And so we're basically just recommending returning to the situation that existed prior to the sort of exceptional um, lockdown experience. And the only other point to make, Chairman, that I wish to draw your attention to is that recommendation five delegates authorities to me in consultation with you to make any decisions during the year about uh, that are advised by the Department for Transport. And that's all to do with the reimbursement of operators where emergency measures were carried, were brought in by the government during previous lockdowns. And this is just simply to say that if the government change their approach to the reimbursement of um, providers through the concessionary national concessionary fare scheme that rather than have to go wait for a formal decision day in order to get approval for that that you delegate approval to me in consultation with you to make any changes should we be asked to do so by the dft during the financial year that the scheme applies for that you're approving today You're on mute. I think your headset might have given up, Professor <laughs> Oppenheimer. <laughs> You're not on mute, but we still can't hear you. Yeah. <laughs> All right, hang on. I'm going to. Oh, I can hear you now. You're back now. No. I, I don't know what happened there. My, head, my headset was misbehaving. Um, Thank you, Stuart. And I just wonder whether anyone wishes to comment on the concessionary travel scheme item. Martin? No? Uh, no, I mean, I, I think this is a fully supported. It seems like a pragmatic step forward as part of a return to normality. I, I think the only thing maybe uh, that we need to keep having conversations, and I know it's something we're trying to do, is um, when we look at travel patterns, there's been a clear drop off with people on the concessionary travel scheme. If we're able to do things maybe through promotional offers or other such approaches, I'm not entirely sure how we would do it to encourage, uh, to, to, to make, get messages out telling concessionary scheme users that it's safe to get back on the buses, that the buses are all still there, um, to support the agenda of driving reuse when people renew, that could be a productive thing to do. All right, thank you for that comment. Uh, Councillor Philpott, would you like to comment? 
Yes, uh, yes, thank you, Russell. Um, I wish I'd have had an excuse ready just a few moments ago when uh, when, when Councillor Humby was asking me uh, for my comments about headsets and so on. Um, just to say that uh, that the, the the paragraph 14 shows that uh, the, the concessionary uh, pass holders uh, rate sounds at around 60% of pre-COVID rates. I was in correspondence with Mark Reddy, who's the chief executive of uh, First Bus, and he was advising me that uh, overall the rates are around 71% of pre-COVID, which would imply that there's a particular difficulty and a particular issue with concessionary pass holders. And I would certainly concur with the comments that Councillor Todd just made now, just now, especially considering that our BSIP very much uh, uh, relies on our uh, ability to be able to get back to pre-COVID rates by March 2023. And, uh, and so we have a particular uh, challenge, I would suggest, with, uh, with concessionary pass holders. So if there's any way between sort of now and then and during the period of the BSIP, depending on the outcome, of course, of the government's uh, consideration of, of, of that bid, uh, that we can, uh, we can concentrate resources uh, on the uh, concessionary pass holders, because clearly it appears to me that the concessionary pass holders are more reluctant to come back to the buses Thank you, Steve. And yes, I agree. I mean, it makes sense if you think about it. Older people are more cautious about uh, getting out and about in this post pandemic period, but we need to reassure them that it's safe. And um, for my part, I think wearing face masks on buses is something that we could encourage just to give other people confidence that they're going to be safe on the buses. You know, you could argue that the automatic renewal is a, a good reason to go on the bus. People want to keep their bus pass active, so they need to go out and renew it by taking a trip on a bus. But it has to be said, it's a very mild incentive because they can always renew it online if they need to. Um, but yes, the bus service improvement plan that was approved at the last decision day by Councillor Humvee is a very important milestone, and we are working very closely with the, the bus operators in order to get back up to those pre-COVID levels. So without further ado, I would like to turn to the recommendations on page 109. And Katie, I'd like to approve the recommendations set out in paragraphs two, three, four and five, please. That brings us to the final item on the agenda today, which is the school streets pilot update. And over to you, Stuart, again, to introduce this item. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, yes, again, I think this is a relatively straightforward item, so I won't spend a lot of time. I know you've um, taken a close interest in the School Streets pilot work to date. Um, the purpose of the report today is to seek your approval to continue or to maintain the School Streets pilots beyond the original um, date for ending the scheme pending the, the outcome of the pilot being evaluated and considered and brought forward to cabinet for a, dis, a decision in the early part of, of uh, 2022 um, about the future of the scheme. And it was felt that it would not be appropriate in the interim to remove the, the school streets pilots from the schools that wish to continue running them. Two of the three would like to. One of the schools has said that they, they would prefer um, the current pilot scheme to end um, at this point. So the recommendation today is that you authorise the continuation um, of the pilot in the two schools that are interested in keeping it going. And that will, of course, also have the benefit of providing further data to feed into the evaluation of the school street scheme, um, which will be first considered by the select committee after the discussion on the work programme this morning, and will then come forward to cabinet with a recommendation on the approach, which will take into account the views of the economy, transport and environment select committee uh, along the way. Uh, that's all by way of introduction, Chairman. Thank you, Stuart. Um, uh, well, I'll certainly be happy to take a comment there. Uh, Councillor Todd, did you want to comment? Yes, thank you very much indeed, Councillor Oppenheimer. Yes, there. I know there's a lot of interest in these schemes across the county. There's a lot of other places that are keen to see them implemented. Uh, and and uh, particularly environmental groups are keen that we're ambitious in this area. Um, 
I th we definitely need to keep the schemes running in the schools that are interested in them. I think the worst possible approach is to switch things off and on again, partly because I think we'll keep learning as people uh, experience the schemes for longer and we learn what it's like actually in year two of a scheme or year three of a scheme. And if we have that continuous process, we're learning how to keep operating them. Uh, and what it takes and learning how to operate them better. I, I think it's important we keep learning and we keep open to finding ways to make things better as we go through them. So I, I would support keeping the schemes running. And the only other request I'd have is, you know, do we want to, um, let's be ready to expand uh, quickly if we think we have got something successful um, and to tap into that interest and demand that is out there. So uh that would be the, the sort of second point which is don't necessarily you know wait until we've got to the very end of the evaluation and everybody being happy with it type process start thinking about um how we can move quickly once we have the results um assuming you know in the event that they're positive and, and show that it is an intervention worth making thank you councillor todd um you're absolutely right there is a lot of interest across the council on this I think it's great that the cabinet is going to be the committee which makes a decision on the report into these pilot schemes. Um, so, you know, this is really a holding decision that's being put to me today to extend the schemes and then the cabinet will, will look at it early next year. Um, Councillor Philpott. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Chairman. Um, I was disappointed to see in paragraph 10 that uh, that Alvestoke Infant School had to pull out of the scheme. That is that is a shame, it's a disappointment. Uh, but I completely agree with other speakers and with yourself that this is a, a, an excellent idea and that we should continue with the pilot. Uh, I was slightly alarmed by uh, by paragraph 12. Uh, in in so far as it says uh, that it would come back to uh, will be considered by the ET Select Committee if required, but I'm reassured by the comment from uh, from uh, Mr Jarvis just a moment ago to say that it, it, it will be coming back to the ET Select Committee. I know that that was discussed this morning at the uh, briefly at the work programme uh, item at the ET Select Committee and members very much welcome the uh, the opportunity to comment upon it and to make a, I believe, a valuable and uh, and positive contribution to to the debate on on school streets. And we look forward to doing that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Philpott. And um, yes, although one of the schools has dropped out, there'll be some learning from that about how we engage with schools in the build up to the process and what what commitments they need to understand are going to be required of them. Um, but yes, I do look forward to discussing this with your committee, Councillor Philpott. So thank you for those comments. Uh, Councillor Humby, Rob, did you have anything you wanted to say about school streets? Uh, nothing to add on that at the moment. I think uh, Stuart's got his hand up, Russell. Oh, yes. Thank you. Stuart, back to you to respond. Thank you very much, Chairman. Just a point of clarification on, on Councillor Phil Plott's observation. The reason that the report was phrased like that was because the Select Committee hadn't made the decision to add it to the work programme at that point, Councillor Phil Plott, um, not because there was no intention to offer the opportunity. Thank you, Stuart. So without any further ado, I will move to the recommendations which are set out on page 117 and Katie I would like to accept the recommendations there in paragraph 2 and in paragraph 3 please. Thank you very much. That brings us to the end of my decision so I'm going to hand back to Councillor Humby to wrap up. Councillor Alpina thank you uh, very much for that. Um, I'd just like to say a big thank you again to Mr Sullivan um, uh, uh, and Mr Thomas for the presentations they made. Also to the entire officer team and Stuart with all the team as well. There's a, what a lot of people can't see. There's a lot of people in the background there that are there to sort of help us back up, whether it's legal, whether it's comms or finance. So thank you to all of them. And as ever, um, to Katie, who organises everything and is really the one in control. So well done to Katie. Thank you very much. So we'll bring the meeting to a close. I'd just like to say again, 
Apologies for the delayed start. These things do happen, but um, thanks to the FN team for being able to organise that. Um, it just happens every now and again. We hope it doesn't happen too often, which it doesn't, but thanks to them as well. So I would draw the meeting to a close. Thank you all very much. Thank you.